giant brood pattern. That's so pretty. Well, you're not trying to push, right? Welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather and we have experienced what I sincerely hope is our last frost for the season. I think our low got down to 34. Thankfully, it was just a super light frost. I think maybe even some frost tender stuff like our rhubarb and our bee balm and things like that. I think that they should probably pull through just fine. And in the greenhouse here, it stayed over 50 degrees and that is amazing. I was really hoping for that because I do have some seedlings in some pots. Super fresh seedlings in some pots, I might add. So these are actually black eyed peas in this tray, the whole thing. These are purple hull pink eyed peas and I see a couple of them coming up. Over here I have several different varieties of vining plants and we'll talk about that later. And that last tray there I planted just a few days ago. It's got bush style watermelons and bush style squashes. Is it squashes? Squashes or squash? It feels like squash is probably correct. <laughs> It's actually been several hours now and it's the afternoon and everything looks really good in the garden. That was a very light frost, which I'm very grateful for. Hopefully it's our last one. I really think it is. I had covered some of the asparagus just because I didn't want the asparagus to get knocked down again. We had a frost probably a few weeks ago that was a lot harder and it knocked down the progress that the asparagus already had and I didn't want that to happen again. But I wasn't able to really cover all of my asparagus and the asparagus that I didn't cover wasn't damaged. So that tells you how light that frost was. These are our sweet potatoes. I am getting them used to the full sun. They've been sitting on my front porch for a little while. On the front porch, the sweet potatoes probably got three hours of direct sun and then nothing for the rest of the day. So pretty soon here, I'm gonna need to bring them back under the porch because I don't want to take them from three hours of sun straight into 12 to 14 hours of sun. That's way too big of a jump, but it's a good thing that we're having a little bit of cloudy, rainy weather this week. Sometimes it can really help the plants transition because although some UV rays do come through the clouds, it's a lot gentler of a transition to transition a plant during cloudy, rainy rainy times. Got some strawberries in the works. I cannot wait. So we looked at these seedlings a little bit earlier and I'm really excited about this flat in particular. So this one has a whole bunch of different vining fruits and I don't have a whole ton of space that makes sense to grow a lot of sprawling and rambling things until this year. So earlier in the season, I put down a hundred foot lane of weed fabric in between two of our goat pastures. And essentially that serves to kill the grass underneath. And I plan to plant a whole bunch of rambling things like different types of melons and cucumbers in that space this year. So as far as germination goes, it looks like I've got quite a few of the bait alpha cucumbers coming up. My gherkins are coming up. One of the loofah gourds is coming up. I worried a little bit about these. The loofah seeds need scarification. You need to rough them up a little bit in order for them to germinate well. And I've got at least one of those successfully coming up. So hopefully we have more. I planted four. Looks like I have a Kajari melon coming up and 
basically, yes, every pot of the armpit melon that I planted is coming up. So if you were here with us last year, you know that we had a really cool melon come up in the garden. I had intentionally planted Kajari melons from melon seed that I had saved from the year prior, but what grew was not exactly a Kajari. It looked like a Kajari, but it was more muted in color and it was fuzzy, which is really weird. Kajaris are not that way. They're smooth. They're really brightly orange when they ripen. And this was totally different. The insides too of Kajaris are green and the inside of this melon was orange. So after, you know, thinking about what I had planted next to what I had determined that we had a hybrid on our hands. So two different heirloom varieties of melon. It was the Charente melon and the Kajari melon had crossed somehow. And I had gotten a really cool hybrid out of it. The flavor, is so hard to describe. So I call it the armpit melon because it is really musky. It retains a lot of that muskiness and it almost has a savory type flavor to it. It was very close to a tomato, believe it or not, a really sweet tomato, but it tasted a lot like a tomato. So I had saved the seed from that armpit melon. And usually, you know, F1 hybrids like that, they're not stable. So I probably can't expect to have that exact same melon again this year, but I want to see what it's going to do. I think it's going to be a cool experiment. There's four of those here. So as I mentioned, it's a little bit after noon and it's 89 degrees in the greenhouse, which honestly, that temperature doesn't bother me. Everything that I've got in here is fine at that temperature and that's gonna help my seeds germinate well. We are having another cold morning tomorrow morning. It's not gonna be a frosty type morning, but it's still upper 30s, low 40s. And so I'd like to keep things a little bit more closed up. Hey girls, where's the little babies? I see them. You doing good? Yeah. So I freaked out there for a second because um, I saw that big bird. I saw the big bird flying over the barn, which it doesn't always concern me. Apparently though, the buzzards with the red heads will go after live animals. So our neighbors have warned us that if we have our goats kidding to make sure that we're there when, we're, when they're kidding, they have beef cattle um, because the buzzards with the red heads will come down and like eat the eyes out of the baby calves and things. Um, it's horrible. So I don't have anybody giving birth today, but I do have really tiny Nigerian dwarf goats that would be pretty easy for a large bird just to swoop down and pick up. And when I saw the bird, I also saw our other livestock guardian. This is Mars. I had seen Buster kind of run up to the side of the pasture and start to kind of, it wasn't quite a bark, but I heard a noise coming from him all the way from the greenhouse and I freaked out a little bit that maybe something was happening to the goats, but they all look okay. Would have been swooping down like right here. But everyone seems all right. You were down by the pond. Can you stay with the herd, please? We've never had that happen where, really, we've never had any kind of predatory thing happen to our goats, thankfully, but I mean, it could happen. It really could. So I don't remember what I was talking about, but I remember what I was doing and I have been, oops, I've been giving a little bit of fertilizer to the starts that are in here. I have planted them and what I think is subpar potting mix or it's actually garden soil mixed with perlite created a potting mix by doing that. And they are starting to respond to the last feeding that I gave them. I feel like the tops, the new growth that's coming in is starting to look a little bit greener. They're definitely ready to go in the ground and I'm not quite ready. It's probably gonna happen this weekend. So I've got to water them one more time. I'm gonna put a little bit more of this in there. So I find that this works really well. We actually grew our 
hydroponic tomatoes with this start to finish and we got lots of really great little tiny orange hat tomatoes out of our out of our hydroponic system by using this so I know that it's a complete feed that does really well taking a plant from seedling up to fruiting I'm just gonna put half a dropper full in the tray and then fill up to where I can see the water coming up above above the tray this is what I mean so I've got this little tray in here see the water so even though this dill plant is dead <laughs> it you can see that it's sitting down in the liquid and it will be sucking that liquid up so this is the time of year with our rabbits that we're really watching the weather we're watching the 10-day forecast we're trying to determine when to stop breeding for the summer so we have Californian meat rabbits here and they're a heavy body breed and they can heat stress really easily in the summertime. So I have a fan in the rabbit tree, but just being pregnant taxes them a whole bunch. And so I don't want them trying to deal with that while also just trying to deal with the heat. So it's a really good opportunity today that it's now that it's cool outside to go ahead and breed our rabbits again, probably the last time until fall time. So the two rabbits that I'm gonna to breed today have four week old kits with them. We like to breed when they still have kits on them because by the time I need to take the kits away at six weeks old, mama is halfway through her next gestation and she gets two weeks off to rest, recuperate, and get her milk retransitioning into newborn milk before she kindles again. And so this is the perfect opportunity to rebreed these two does. I have two bucks and I like to breed two does at the same time if I can. If I can breed them on the exact same day, I try to only breed them a day apart just in case something happens with either one of the mothers or either one of the litters, I'm able to foster kits over to the other mother. And that has happened, so I try to keep that up. So it looks like we did get one of the two does successfully bred. I'm gonna have to try the other one a little bit later, but I also have three does that are due to give birth in the next couple days and they need to have their nest boxes. What I like to use are these KW Cages nest boxes. They are nice and airy and cool. They have this ventilation here in the back and then there's this bottom that comes out to clean it when needed. And all I'm gonna do is stuff this thing chock full of hay and mama is gonna make a beautiful nest out of this. Well, you're all right. It's okay. Well, it's okay. Oh my gosh. Whoa. Whoa. I got her. I can't say that's ever happened to me before, but now it's on camera. <laughs> so this was our jumper. She's a first time mom and she's never really had anything like that, like of that size, enter her space before. And I guess it was pretty scary. So she should chill out over time. Hopefully she's a good mom for us. We don't really require that our meat does be super cuddly and friendly. It's really honestly not what they were bred to be. But in a few days, she's gonna have her first set of babies and we hope and pray that she utilizes that nest box that she seems to be so scared of. So the next thing on my checklist of things to do is I need to get into one of my swarms that I caught recently and make sure that they have a laying queen. So I have been actually selling the swarms that I've caught out of my honeybee colonies this year and there's a demand for it. So that's really awesome. But I've got someone hopefully coming this weekend to pick up their bees, their nuke of bees, but I don't want them to do so if there's might be something wrong, like maybe they don't have a laying queen. I haven't looked at them since I caught them and I actually did not get this swarm catch on video. It was the first day of my content break that I took a couple weeks ago. I had a swarm come out of one of my colonies and I caught them and it was kind of nice to be able just to catch the bees without having to worry about the camera or anything like that. I did take a couple pictures and I'll put them in here. Ooh, looks like something exciting could be happening today anyways out of the colony, see that? It's probably another swarm prep, totally fine. I have three, four actually separate swarm traps set up around my property and I've been asked before, Heather, why don't you split your bees <laughs> before they swarm? The, the honest answer is I have a lot going on and the bees 
are relatively self-sufficient. I can't say that about things like my rabbits or my goats or my garden because those things need a lot more attention. Now the bees, this is a very busy time of year for them, but they've got it. They know what they're doing. Swarming isn't inherently a bad thing. It's what bees do naturally to reproduce. And honestly, it's a lot easier on my bad arm to catch a swarm than to try to split a colony. And I quite often, I feel like quite often catch them. And so it's not really a big deal to me if they swarm. I'm not really into beekeeping for the honey. A lot of people don't like their bees to swarm because it means that the colony takes a little bit of a hit with their population. And and then if you don't have a huge population, you don't necessarily get a huge honey crop. But as I mentioned, it's not a super big deal to me. So I'm totally cool catching swarms or not. Either way, I tried to catch them though. So here is the swarm in question. They are on the ground here. And this is actually one of my swarm traps. So we're gonna look in there and make sure that they have a laying queen. Oh yeah, they've definitely been building comb. I do not have my uh, smoker. I didn't really want to fire it up just to look at one small colony. So we're just moving slowly. And that's a ton of brood. So these guys started out with literally nothing and they are more than ready to go to their new home. See that giant brood pattern? I haven't even fed this swarm, so. Very good. No smoker, no angry bees following me. Nobody even tried to come for my face or anything like that. So I feel good about the nice friendly bees that someone is about to get from our farm. Something's definitely going on with that colony. So I'm gonna have to keep my eyes on the sky today. Usually I can step outside and just be able to tell from my side porch if there's a whole bunch of bees in the air or not. With normal activity, they're flying in and out of the front of the colonies really rapidly, doing their lovely bee thing. With a swarm, they're like, they're more circling in the air. And gradually the circle of bees starts kind of drifting. That colony is probably gearing up to swarm either today or possibly tomorrow. They do a little practice swarm sometimes and that's kind of what that looks like, but I don't know, I'm gonna have to keep my eyes peeled. I can't even express to you guys how exciting it is to see a swarm of bees that started with literally nothing and wasn't fed, how slam packed that colony is. It has not been long, it's been just a couple weeks. I don't know, it just kind of makes you feel like you're doing something right. I'm telling you, sometimes my days can be kind of random, so I'm bringing you along for the ride today. And I really want to get some of our asparagus fermenting. I have never had fermented asparagus before. I have been told that it is absolutely lovely. So I am just going to do a really simple fermentation today. I'm just going to put the asparagus in a salt brine, let it sit for around a week, give it a taste test, see what I think. I have heard of people adding onions. I've heard of people adding garlic. I want to start with a base and understand what it tastes like just as is and think about what maybe I want to add later because we'll be pulling asparagus out of the garden for a couple months still. So what I'm going to be working with is a half gallon jar here. This is a wide mouth ball jar. I've got this quart jar here to make my brine solution. And of course I have my asparagus. So I'm going to have to snap this down to size. And these asparagus are just out of the garden unwashed and and I do have a couple little flimsy ends. I'm just gonna snap those off. I don't think those, those are gonna add anything to the fermentation. And I think in order to help them stand up the way that I want them to in the jar, I'm actually gonna load the jar kind of laying down like this. Okay, 
at it lovely in that jar. Isn't that so pretty? So now I want to fill this up with the brine to be above the spears. So this is a half gallon jar. There's probably a little bit more than a quart's worth of liquid space in here. And the ratio that I like to use with my ferments is three tablespoons of salt, non-iodized salt. I think right now I have sea salt, but I have used the pink Himalayan salt in the past. And it's, so that's three tablespoons per quart of filtered water. So we have our Berkey over here. I don't want to be using chlorinated water because the chlorine is going to kill off everything, including the good bacteria. And what I want to do is culture the good bacteria. The salt in the brine is going to kill the bad bacteria and allow the good bacteria and enzymes and things to do their job fermenting this food. Some people will use warm water or they'll heat up the water just to dissolve the salt a little bit more completely. It's actually pretty unnecessary to do that. Um, you'll be able to dissolve enough of the salt initially and over time the rest of the salt will dissolve and it'll work out just fine. So you probably noticed there as I filled up the rest of the way with the brine that some of the asparagus is starting to float. And in order to keep molds and things at bay, I need to keep everything under the brine. And I'm gonna use this little fermentation weight, it's glass, to put it down in there and keep everything submerged. I don't ever have a great way to put these in. It has this little handle, but I always slip. So I'm just gonna drop it like so. See the fermentation weight is in place and it's keeping everything submerged. There's a couple different fermentation lids that you can use. I like to use these stretchy lids. I'll link them in the description box below. It's not an affiliate link, but I really enjoy these and you don't see these very often. You see the ones that kind of have like a little spout or a nipple on the top and these work functionally the same. There's a little ball bearing in this lid here that will allow gases and things to escape without allowing molds and things and dust to get into the fermentation. So I've got the date put on the jar. I'm gonna check it in about a week. But in the meantime, it's gonna sit in our bedroom, which we always keep the shades shut so it's cool and dark and just let it ferment away. So we're actually in a place that you guys have never seen before because I have something really exciting in my shower. Oh, hello. They are still slightly scared of me. I got them in the mail, through the mail, about three days ago. And this was right before we were supposed to get those slightly more chilly than normal temperatures for our area. And I wanted them to be safe and warm. I wanted them to learn how to eat and drink and find the heat lamp without having to struggle with the outside temperatures. So inside my shower they are. This is how we have brooded many, many birds, many quail, many chickens. This is how we've done it. So I have this corrugated, I think I got this from Cackle Hatchery, this corrugated brooder. It really can fit kind of any shape that you would need it to because it's, you know, it moves around. And I like to brood our chicks on a towel. And I don't do this for very long, but until they learn what to eat, sometimes they can be a little bit bumbling and, you know, unsure about life. This helps them not eat shavings. So we got 26 birds in the mail. I'll put the breeds right here. I can only really remember that I got some olive eggers and I got some morans. All 26 birds have lived. We actually purchased them from Welp Hatchery this year. I have used a few different hatcheries and we've never been disappointed with Welp Hatchery. I don't feel like they're super well known like some of the other hatcheries, but they give us really quality birds. Not that we order birds all the time. I actually don't really like raising chickens, but I really like eating eggs. So these guys are actually going to be replacing our egg layers that we purchased in 2019 and 2020. But I need to get them into the outside brooder so I can have my shower back. No, stay in. So I've got my box of goodies. If you can, when you get chicks in the mail, if you can hold on to this little box, it comes in really useful when you have to move them around. And also in the first week, probably the first two weeks, I like to check each and every one of them on their back end for a thing called pasty butt. So a lot of people don't realize that you need to be looking at your new chick's bum every day to make sure that it's not getting 
compacted. Sometimes the stools come out and they stick to those really fine feathers um, near their vent. And if they can't poop because of stuck poop on the outside, then they're gonna go septic and die. So it's something that you really need to be able to be checking for at least every other day. I like to check them every day. Sometimes that's not feasible. I'm gonna be looking at their rear ends as I take them out of this box and put them into the brooder. So we actually made this brooder here out of our baby crib. So this crib is where all four of our children started started out their lives. And when we went to move, I almost didn't bring this with us. Um, I almost just sold it in Kansas. But then I looked at it and I said, you know what? That would make a really awesome chick brooder. So we have some wire on the outside and we can hang a heat lamp. This is actually the part of the bed that holds up the crib mattress and it makes a really nice lid. And this thing has served us very, very well. So, nice clear vent, tiny bit of poo, no big deal. Looks like they're all kind of huddling in the wrong corner, but they'll figure it out. They're old enough to where they realize they need to be seeking out that heat source and they will absolutely find it. I'll keep eye on them throughout the day. They're just in here in my garden shed and they'll be in here for another probably four to five weeks. Whenever they're fully feathered, that's when we'll begin to slowly introduce them to the current flock. How you doing? You're just getting comfortable. You're not trying to push, right? Right? Up next, technically, on the calendar to deliver is Talia. Her due date is on Friday. So a week from today, Monday, is Barely's due date. Barely is one of our original Nigerian dwarf dairy goats from Living Traditions Homestead, and she is humongous. She is much bigger than I have ever seen her and she's been looking really really big and really really uncomfortable and her ligaments are super super soft so honestly it would not surprise me if Barely went a little bit early so we might have a race to see who's actually going to deliver next. In either case I cannot wait. Kidding season has been going on for us for a long time. We like to spread out our kidding season because it's so much easier on me with everything that we have going on on the farm to not have to worry about, you know, 12 dairy goats giving birth in like a two week time frame. That's a lot. That would take literally all of my attention. And unfortunately, I don't have that much attention to give for that long to any one thing. So if you've missed some of those births and you'd like to catch up, I have this playlist up here. This is the end of 2022, early 2023 kidding season and if you're interested a little bit more in fermenting I have this fermented cucumelons video that I took last year those cucumelons were so so good I can't wait to do that again this year